Okay, hello everybody. This is our Optus first uh, technical webinar. So we want to say welcome to everybody, and um, we'd like to uh, to uh, go over some of the topics that we're going to uh, present today. The first topic will be on Spales um, best practices, and the second topic we will have for uh, HUD, HUD um, optical analysis um, demonstration. Um, we do ask that you please keep your questions to the end. Um, you can, if you're on the, the WebEx, you can go ahead and just type in uh, under chat, type your questions in, we'll take them and we'll um, respond to all questions at the end of the uh, presentation. Um, the first presentation for Spiel's best practices will be Keyshore. Most of you know Keyshore, so um, I'm gonna turn it over to him now for the presentation. Thanks, Mike. Um, hello, everyone. This is Kishore, um, an application engineer with Optus North America here in the Troy office. So today, um, the agenda is going to be um, an hour presentation from myself um, on these uh, visual ergonomics best practices. We'll break for about an hour in the middle, and then we'll resume at 1 o'clock with a presentation um, from Claire who will be talking about uh, some of the challenges regarding head-up display um, optical design and analysis. Uh, first of all, thanks for those who were able to attend in person. So for this first session, uh, this will be the agenda. Um, we'll go over some hardware and simulation recommendations and then a few examples and use cases from interior and exterior lighting. And to finish, we'll talk about a um, somewhat new uh, topic in, for Optus uh, with regard to the high-performance computing. Again, as uh, Mike mentioned, um, feel free to ask any questions uh, through the chat uh, throughout the, the presentation. I will try to answer as many of them at the end as possible. We'll probably have about 10, 15 minutes for questions. For those in person as well, um, you can keep questions just to the end. So Spios Visual Ergonomics, um, this is a module which allows you to visualize in high quality the results of your geometry, materials, and sources. It allows you to validate and measure the physical appearance, appearance of your headlamp or tail lamp or entire car body uh, in order to reduce costs of physical prototyping and tooling. Okay. There, there are many applications of the visual ergonomic module. Um, it applies both to interior lighting and exterior lighting. And the idea is to try to uh, identify potential issues um, in your design at an early stage so that you can make necessary changes or to uh, produce high quality results which can be used at a later stage for review. Some examples um, include veiling glare or unwanted reflections um, from an interior perspective or light bleed from a lens uh, for looking at more at exterior purposes. A large part of the visual ergonomics module has to do with um, qualitative perception. So at this stage, we're looking at um, how a certain result will be perceived or how a um, render will appear to uh, an observer. And this is the importance of the visual ergonomics module. The, human, the uh, visual ergonomics module um, the idea is to compare very closely with reality. So it takes into account many parameters with, uh, with respect to the human vision. And so the results that you get should match very closely with the real parts. So just some examples of um, where this could be useful. Um, so looking at veiling glare, this has a huge impact on safety. Uh, if this veiling glare appears in a position um, in, a, in a critical position, it could imp impede your ability to detect certain things in your windshield. So, for example, if you're driving through a tunnel, you can see 
how the veiling glare could affect your ability to see a car in front of you or an oncoming car. So to begin, we'll talk about some um, hardware recommendations. This is something that is um, often overlooked but can make can have a huge impact in how a result is perceived. So for a start, um, calibration of a monitor is extremely important if we're trying to use uh, a visual result to make decisions. Um, the color of a display can change drastically from an uncalibrated display to a calibrated display. So as an example, these are two pictures taken um, before a calibrated screen and after a calibrated screen. So you can see how drastically some of the colors can change um, after the calibration is taken into account. The actual coordinates of the pixels won't change, but the way that the result appears uh, can drastically change. And so if these results are being used for any sort of review, um, you know, the visual, if that's taken into account, then the calibration is extremely important. Another aspect um, which is important is the resolution of the display that's being used. In order to properly display um, some DOCE results, uh, a high dynamic res resolution monitor is important. This allows you to see the high and low intensity areas in the same result, rather than one of these two being clipped. It also improves uh, the realism of a result with regards to glare or um, luminance saturation, and also for properly representing different colors. So as a note, uh, Optus has partnered with um, several leading hardware providers for visual visualization needs. So we can assist with this if um, any customer has a specific need for visualization. Um, we can uh, put you in touch with the right contacts. So next, we'll go over some um, general simulation recommendations before going into the specifics of you know, either interior or exterior lighting. So the key to not only VE simulations, but really any video simulation, is to have correct input definitions. So not having the correct inputs will lead to results that are either incorrect or uh, that don't appear to be nice. So this includes uh, everything from the definition of the light sources to correctly applying um, optical properties to correct sensor location. All three of these are extremely important, especially for VE simulations. Another important factor to take into account is the vision mode in which a result is being viewed. So depending on the ambient light in a result, a different vision mode will be used. And these three are scotopic, mesopic, and photopic. And depending on which vision mode you are in, um, different aspects of the human vision will be used. For example, in a high light condition, uh, the cones of your eyes are more sensitive versus a low light condition, the rods are more sensitive. So this is important to take into account because if we're looking in a low light condition, then we know that um, the color perception will be much lower. In terms of some general simulation parameters, um, these are probably three of the more important ones to keep in mind and sometimes are overlooked, so I wanted to highlight them a little bit. The geometrical distance tolerance is one which can reduce the number of errors you have uh, due to very small structures. So if you have uh, geometry which is very close to each other, it's important to decrease the geometrical distance tolerance from its default value. And you'll notice this in the number of errors that you get in your simulation. If you see something that's over 10%, one area to look at is to decrease your geometrical distance tolerance. If those errors um, stay after decreasing the tolerance, 
Another area to look at is the meshing. So the default value of meshing can be okay for um, non-complex geometry, but once we start getting into uh, more complex optics or larger bodies, it, it's very important to increase the meshing. And this will have an effect both on the um, quality of the simulation as well as uh, the errors that you might see in your simulation. So if you have errors such as volume conflicts or volume bodies not being closed, this can sometimes be uh, corrected by increasing the meshing. Finally, for um, light guide designs or very diffusive materials, it's often um, necessary to increase the maximum impact number. So this number will limit the number of bounces that rays are allowed. And if you have a simulation with many bounces, it's necessary to increase this number in order to allow for those bounces. One note on this is that increasing this number could lead, uh, increasing it too high could lead to stray rays which bounce um, sort of infinitely and could, re could lead to a, a drastically increased simulation time. So just a further note on meshing. As an example, um, these are three different meshing um, values, let's say, that were used for this um, body of a car, and often you can see visually whether the meshing is sufficient. So the top left would be sort of a default meshing value. The top right is a slightly increased meshing value, and the bottom would be a um, very increased meshing value. And so the top left one is probably not sufficient for representing this body, and then it's a decision between the right two um, for which one you want to actually use. A higher meshing will lead to a um, longer initialization time, but is recommended for um, a higher quality result. So all um, VE simulations are generally viewed inside what we call the Virtual Human Vision Lab. So this is our viewer for um, taking into account all things related to human perception. So this includes um, previous luminance adaptation, the age of an observer, color deficiencies, and glare. Uh, one note on this is that the Human Vision Lab is also available as a standalone version. It's something that's very light to install, and so it can be used for higher level design reviews where you might not want BIOS installed, but having just the viewer allows you to uh, play with some of these parameters in real time when you're doing some of your reviews. So some settings inside the Human Vision Lab which are important to take into account. Um, one of them is color management. So any display will have a certain gamut which uh, it can use for displaying colors. So that can be seen on the right picture with the triangle. If you have a color in your result which is outside of this range, the software has to make a decision on how it represents this color. So there's three different options for representing the color. The first is gamut clipping. In this option, the simulation, or the result rather, tries to keep the color as close as possible, but this leads to a lot of saturation in the result. The second option, which is maintain lightness and hue, is um, the best way to see the dynamic range of a result, but it produces a sort of whitish um, appearance in the image. And then the third option, maintain hue, will is sort of a, a compromise between these two. It tries to keep the color as much as possible, but also will partially saturate the result. So just a note, if you're trying to compare the result with an actual photo, um, maintain lightness and hue is recommended because this is how um, real photos will appear as well. So it's best to use the maintain lightness and hue if you're trying to correlate between an actual image. So now we'll sort of split. Um, the first section will deal with some considerations to take into account for interior lighting. And then after this, we'll look at some considerations for exterior lighting. 
So one uh, point which is sometimes not taken into account is in order to get a result or a render that looks nice, it's important to take into account the point of view. So where is your sensor located and what part of the result is included in your, um, in your result, let's say. So depending on what you include and what you don't include, it could change the way that your result is perceived. So it's always good to keep this in mind when you're setting up your sensor position, what you're trying to highlight. So this is an example of a real photo compared with a SPIOS simulation result. Another parameter or another um, consideration is materials and textures. So this is extremely important for interior lighting design where there are lots of textures um, on the geometry. So the first is uh, the material point. So a proper BSDF is um, essential in order to accurately simulate the optical performance of all the geometry. However, to further improve the realism of your results, it's also important to apply a texture onto the geometry. So this is done by first getting a scan or a BSDF of a certain material and then taking a picture of that material. And then the picture can be used as a texture and applied into the material. There's several um, things to take into account when you're creating a texture. And some of those include um, having a very clean image, um, a repeatable pattern. So this repeatable pattern will avoid um, sharp transitions between uh, patterning this texture. And also a, bite, a bright background um, can help with improving uh, the quality of the texture. For exterior sources, um, the luminance level of these sources is important to take into account, especially when using HDRI sources. So these are environment um, sources that take a high quality image and essentially put your geometry inside of this image. So this is a good um, sort of scale for different environments from very dark sky all the way to very bright sky. Another setting which is important for exterior sources in interior lighting simulations is what we call outpath spaces. So this defines which sources are located inside of your car and outside of the car, and also which faces um, the light is allowed to enter the car from. So this includes your windows and windshield and maybe a roof window as well. So setting the outpath faces to only the surfaces that light can escape and also defining which sources are located outside of your car and inside of the car can uh, dramatically speed up the time it takes to simulate. Along the same note, another parameter which can increase or decrease the simulation time is fast transmission gathering. So this will neglect um, refractions through very thin surfaces or volumes that um, are very thin volumes, I should say. So this includes uh, windows and windshields. A basic process for setting up a scene for an interior lighting study um, is as follows. The first would be to select the HDRI image that you want to use. Once you have this image, it's important to orientate the image correctly by setting the north direction. So you can see this um, as you change the angle of the north, you'll see the direction of your image changing as well. Next is to set the luminance. So we saw on the previous slide um, some typical values of different scenes. So whatever environment you're trying to simulate, it's important to set that luminance value accordingly. And the way we do that is we have a sensor to 
which is aimed at the sky. And then we use the um, luminance value that the sensor receives and modify the value of the source until the sensor is receiving the correct luminance value. The last thing to do is to set the sun position. So often in HDRI um, scenes, it will include a sun in the result or in the image. However, this sun is not bright enough to really represent the contrast between an environment and the actual sun. And so normally we would add another sun on top of the HDR image. So to avoid the conflict between potentially having two suns, it's important to properly set the direction of the sun so that it's in the exact same direction as the sun from the image. This way, um, you don't take into account two bright spots from your environment. A useful feature for um, positioning all of these aspects is the set ambient source as background feature, which is available in the Theos for Katia version. So this allows you to visualize your scene in the background of your 3D view and um, easily angle the north correctly. Another important consideration for simulations is the number of passes that are required. So most interior lighting simulations use a Monte Carlo algorithm where the higher number of passes will provide a higher quality result. However, different types of sources require different number of passes in order to be accurately simulated. So these include um, display sources and uniform sources, which would have a lower number of passes required, to environment sources, which have a higher number of passes required. So one useful uh, tip is to simulate the different sources individually and then combine the results at the end using the photometric calculator. So this allows you to um, separate the sources requiring a low number of passes from those requiring a high number of passes and improve your overall simulation time. So that tool, the photometric calculator, um, is available and allows you to combine results from different XMPs into one XMP. The recommended operation is called union map. This combines results together while keeping their individual layers um, separate so that you can go back and forth between the individual layers. One use case um, for interior lighting is to determine the worst case sun position. So this is useful for seeing um, what directions of sun or ma what materials could impede um, a driver um, as they're you know, looking at different, different areas of the car. So in order to do this, um, we first identify the surfaces of interest. So these generally include highly reflective surfaces, which could cause specular reflections towards the driver. We then create an interactive source from the driver position towards these reflective surfaces. We run an interactive simulation using all of the geometry in the car. And then using Light Expert, we can export these rays, which um, we can export the rays which would escape the car, so through the windshields or the windows and use these lines to define the direction of the sun. So in this way, you're determining which direction of sun will strike different materials and reach the driver eye position. So this can be used for evaluating whether different materials uh, could cause issues or whether the angle of the actual geometry prevents the material from causing any issue. Some examples of 
interior lighting. So this photo I showed on the first slide as well. Um, you can see in this result several different um, effects. So there's, you can see the veiling glare in the windshield wash out on the display, retro reflections, aspherical mirrors, and also reflections on the windows. So this result was generated using all of those um, recommendations that were mentioned, so correctly setting the materials, uh, the sources, the environment, and the driver and the uh, sensor position. The same study could be done in a nighttime setting. So this time the environment sources are turned down so that we can investigate uh, the appearance of the interior sources. This is very useful for color harmony. So analyzing how the colors of the different sources inside of a car um, combine together to provide either a satisfactory or unsatisfactory appearance. So just a quick comparison between the photo photometric lab and a human vision lab. So you can see the results initially in the photometric lab and then as uh, we switch to the human vision lab, you can see the human vision parameters affecting the way that simulation appears. And then combining with the display and with the environment source, um, all of these different sources combine together. Switching to exterior lighting considerations. The first important uh, parameter is the sensor resolution. So the resolution of your sensor will greatly uh, define how your result appears in both lit conditions and unlit conditions. In order to have a result that appears smooth, we recommend 2,000 sampling as the minimum for the longer side of the sensor, and then the shorter side should have the same resolution. Almost always you will have a sensor that is not symmetric in both directions, so uh, it's always recommended for the longer side to set the sampling. This will provide a high quality render. However, if you want to zoom in closer to different objects inside of your result, it's important to increase the sampling even further. So something closer to 4,000 is recommended so that even when you zoom in, you can still keep the same smoothness. As a general rule, a higher sampling value will give you a higher quality result, but will also increase your simulation time. So just as a um, note, especially for inverse simulations, a if you double the uh, resolution in the X and the Y, that will give you four times longer simulation. So an example, at 2000, we see the result on the left appears quite nice. However, when we magnify the center of the result, we can see that the edges don't appear to be sharp. So for this, we would have to increase the sampling further. So at 4,000, you can see the edges appear um, sharper. So they, you still have that smooth appearance to the edges. So another consideration is whether to use a direct or an inverse simulation for different sources. For exterior lighting, in general, uh, for evaluating lit appearance, we recommend to use direct simulation. Direct and inverse simulation, uh, given the correct parameters, will provide 
the same result. It's just a question of which one is more efficient at producing that result. For lit appearance, the sensor is generally positioned in an area where it will collect a lot of rays coming from the lamp. And so you're able to achieve a faster result with less noise using a direct simulation. Another advantage for using direct simulations is that you can use multiple sensors in the same simulation and that won't increase your simulation time. Whereas an inverse simulation, the simulation time is multiplied by the number of sensors that you use. So if you're trying to view a certain result from multiple angles, a direct simulation will be much faster. Another note on that same aspect. In the top left, you see uh, the frame of a sensor. For inverse simulations, rays are generated from the origin point of your sensor or from the focal point of your sensor and are launched towards every pixel in the sensor. From this figure, we can see that a lot of the area of the sensor does not include the actual tail lamp. So what this means is that a lot of rays that are generated from an inverse simulation will be wasted as they're not going to actually hit the areas that you're interested in. Normally the sensor area is larger than the lamp itself because we want to include other parts of the car body. So in these cases it's faster and more efficient to use a direct simulation. So you can see a comparison on the bottom between a direct and an inverse. Roughly the same number of rays were used and you can see the quality of the result from the left and the right. So the direct simulation produces a much higher quality for the same number of rays. Another setting which is important to consider is the integration angle. So this represents how much light is being integrated by the detector. For a direct simulations, the probability that a ray will strike exactly at the correct angle to reach the observer position is very low. And so to get a very good quality result, you would need a very high number of rays. In order to compensate for that, the integration angle allows a certain angular tolerance to every ray so that as long as the ray is within that angle, it will still be counted in the result. Having an integration angle which is too large could, re could lead to blurry results, but would be faster to simulate, whereas a smaller integration angle will, be, will provide a more accurate result, but will take a bit longer. Normally for uh, lit renders, we recommend between one to three degrees for the integration angle. So a similar table to what we saw for interior lighting. This is a general recommendation of sampling for a sensor, integration angle, and number of rays. This is split into three sections. A rough study section where you're doing several iterations to try to see the changes from different um, configurations. To a quick review where you have a result that is somewhat satisfactory and you might be trying to review with your peers. Following that, a detailed review which could be presented to your management or to clients. This is a general process for, for, for working through um, a simulation. As an example, in this case we have five different simulations which were merged together. The first at the top left is an inverse simulation which provides the exterior of the car as well as an environment. Following this, each of the individual sources are simulated and then all merge together to provide the overall result. These are some of the simulation settings that were used for this in terms of sensor sampling, integration angle, meshing, and number of rays.
the last topic that I will mention in my part of the presentation is um, SPIOS High Performance Computing. This is a new um, module or a new feature that we've implemented within the last few months. Um, so switching to a model that allows for a very high number of servers to be used for computation. As you might have noticed from some of these larger uh, renders, the simulation time can be quite long. And so it can be necessary to um, perform the simulation on a larger number of servers as opposed to a single machine. So as an example, this simulation um, on the previous distributed computing module uh, model, which was only Windows-based and could only go up to 20 machines. Uh, this simulation took one month versus one day on a HPC um, setup. So you can see the simulation time drastically improving using the HPC model. You can also see the number of solvers which you have access to is um, almost limitless. We can support any size of cluster and now can also support a Linux cluster. So the key benefits of um, the HPC is you can use your existing hardware so if you have a existing um, Linux HPC cluster, Spios now integrates with that cluster. It's very scalable, so from 10 machines to 100 to 500, the performance scales very well. We now support both Windows and Linux, whereas previously only Windows servers were supported. And it's compatible with most standard schedulers. So very little hardware or software changes need to be done in order to utilize the HPC model. From a user point of view, you will find simulations which used to take weeks, now taking hours. So this lets you drastically change your approach to simulations where before you would set up perfectly and run one simulation knowing that it might take several days to complete, you can now run several iterations in a single day and run through many different configurations um, in you know, a single day or a couple of hours. This allows you to have intermediate results on demand. So if a new idea comes up and you want to see what that looks like, you can right away simulate it and have your result back within uh, a short amount of time so that you can use the results for analysis. So some, um, let's say, complaints from previous models um, include the number of time, that, the time that it would take for new iterations. So if your design is changing on a weekly basis, but your simulations are taking a long time to calculate, it defeats the purpose. Um, same with RFQs. If you, need a, if, you need a, if you need to submit a proposal within a short amount of time, you need to have simulations which take a short amount of time as well. So the HPC model allows for this uh, rapid feedback and rapid return. So just to conclude, two last examples of simulations performed on the HPC model versus the traditional distributed computing model. So what you see from both of these is that the performance was drastically improved, so almost 10 times as many rays in almost a tenth of the simulation time using this high-performance high computing model. So just the last slide on Optus. Um, I'm sure most of you are already familiar, but we have a global presence. And in North America, our two offices are located in Detroit and in San Francisco. So thank you for your attention, um, especially for those who are here in person.
And for those who took time to dial in, um, thank you for that as well. If there are any questions from anyone, um, either in person here or people listening in, um, you more than happy to take them at this point. Or for those here, we're more than welcome to discuss after um, this presentation finishes. I'll leave it open for any questions that come in through the chat uh, for the next 10 minutes or so. If there's any live questions, more than, well, more than welcome to ask them. In terms of next steps, um, once this presentation closes, we'll take a break for about an hour for lunch and then resume at 1 o'clock um, with Claire, who will present um, Overcoming Complex Optical Systems, focusing on head-up display. Thank you. Any questions from anyone here? If I'll be distributing what? Uh, yes, I can. We can send the PowerPoint out. Um, in terms of uh, pricing for HPC, uh, that's something for uh, the account managers to handle. So I will refer you to. Um, your corresponding account manager, Vince, um, you know who that is, so. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thanks for your attention. I'm going to keep the webinar running, so it'll just um, be on mute for the next, or maybe not even mute for the next hour or so, um, but we'll start again at 1 o'clock uh, with Claire's presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. For those who are joining us um, for the first time now, we'll be starting the second half of this webinar, which will be given by Claire, who works in our Mountain View office. Uh, the second session will be on heads-up display optical analysis, so our HOA and HPX modules. This is um, an industry-driven product that's currently very trending um, for analyzing head-up display systems and um, seeing visual representations of what those look like. So as before, um, if we could keep all questions until the end of the presentation, it would be appreciated. And also, for those who are looking for a copy of this presentation, as well as the one I presented earlier, um, we'll be sending those out to all our participants who registered um, at the end of the day today. Uh, Claire, I don't know if you're connected. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. I will pass it off to you then, Claire. OK. Thank you, Kishore. Uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Claire and I previously worked um, at Optis Northern Europe. I've recently joined the, the new office here in California and uh, where, where I'm working at a, as an application engineer. So as Kishore introduced, I'll be talking about um, heads-up display today and how Optis tools can help you design and analyze your system. Um, so I'll be going through the following topics, uh, typical issues, then our solution for optical analysis, um, virtual images quality analysis, and then um, conclusion. Um, first, I'd like to show um, a simplified head development process um, that goes from specification up to validation. So there are three main actors. There's the, the OEM, the projector supplier, and the glazing supplier. Um, and it all starts with the human factors and HMI departments, which define the characteristics of the interface and the contents that will be displayed on the HUD according to different use cases. Um, then we have the uh, styling and glazing, and because the windshield acts as an optical com component of the HUD, the, the glazing department is involved and will have iterations between the OEM and the glazing supplier for example, to fix things like the wedge angle um, 
to sort of the, uh, the ghost effect. Um, then it continues with the packaging and electronics departments for the, the, the OEM and the, the optics side for the, uh, the supplier. Um, again, we have quite a few iterations between the two. Then we have the um, the projector tier one, which designs the, the lighting, so the, the picture generation unit for the, uh, the illumination system of the HUD. And finally, uh, we have to analyze and validate the full HUD optical system in terms of image quality, perceived quality, uh, consequences of currencies on manufacturing, um, etc., as well as embedded software. Um, so in this presentation, um, I'd like to say that um, as we as Optis cover uh, most of that, these areas um, and in this presentation I'll focus mainly on the um, optical analysis and uh, visualization parts, uh, but we also have some design tools as I'll mention la later. So the typical hard issues that we can see on the head of display. Um, Kishor shared with you, with you earlier some examples of visual ergonomics typical use cases and head of display is an area in the vehicle where many of these potential issues will meet and they're also intertwined with, with, with other areas of the car which is why a HUD system can't be studied on its own. Uh, that means you can't be sure for example that a, a HUD that works well in one car model will work the same way in another one. And then you have defects which are tied into the, uh, the HUD itself, so you can have distortion. So that's the fact that the image is not perfectly perfectly rectangular. Um, the ghost image, which is coming from the reflection on the outer face of the windshield, which is uh, blurring the main image. Uh, then we have the um, inhomogeneity of the um, of the image, um, mostly coming from the uh, the screen. And so these three are due to the projection system itself. Then we have the contrast that appears between the dashboard reflection and the HUD display window. So, as Kishore mentioned earlier, uh, veiling glare is quite an issue um, um, in cars already. But when you have, when you add a HUD, you have this big hole in your IP, and the contrast between that hole and the rest of the dashboard, especially if you have uh, brighter colors for your your dashboard leather, for example, can be um, very visible from the driver's perspective. Um, then we have stray light, which is um, light from the sun going inside the system, reflecting, for example, on the mirrors, and then going back into the system and creating hot spots, uh, going back, sorry, back out and creating hot spots on the windshield. And finally, um, sunburn, uh, which is light from the sun melting uh, plastic parts when it goes inside um, the projection system. Those last three are due to the environment, meaning the, the sun and the rest of the car. Um, for each of these issues, we have uh, solutions, um, at least ways to analyze these and detect these issues as early as possible. Um, so all these, they, they can be detected very early in the design process. Uh, as you see here, this is an example of visualizing the distortion on the um, on the image, so it takes into account the the windshield and the mirrors. Then we have the, the ghost image. You can see here two simulations. One is uh, without the wedge angle, and you have the blurring, and the other one is with the wedge angle. Uh, we can analyze the inhomogeneity of the um, of the image thanks to luminance calculation, which is the the core functionality of, of SPIOS. But for those of you who already know it. Um, Using uh, typical visual ergonomics studies, we can um, evaluate how the contrast on the edges of the HUD window uh, will impact the car. Um, so that's what we call vainly glare. You see here, it's quite visible. We can analyze the stray light by simulating light propagation from the sun to the driver's eye after reflection on the mirror and the, the housing. And finally, we can analyze the sunburn by propagating visible and infrared lights, focusing on plastic parts of the HUD after reflection on the mirrors. Um, in addition 
to um, these use cases, we also take into account polarization. And this is very important um, in the case of, of head-up display because the, the windshield works very close to the booster angle, uh, which means that the light which is reflected on the windshield would be polarized. Um, and also, of course, we have the polarization of the, uh, of the PGU. So that means that if you're wearing sunglasses, polarized sunglasses, you could be in a situation where you don't actually see um, your, your HUD. Um, we also have a solution to design and analyze the, the PGU. And then finally, we have the visualization tools, which allow to see what the driver would actually see. Um, so it's interesting to then combine these results with an HDR screen um, that Kishore mentioned earlier, because it makes for an even more realistic experience. And um, in hot simulation, the luminance is typically between 10 and 12,000 candle per square meters, um, which means that it's, you can actually visualize it with an HDR screen and have a one-to-one -one luminance scale. Um, so here we see that we can test uh, different driver sizes and how they impact um, how the image will look like and where it will be. A uh, second interesting point is the, the result is, can be done for both left and right eye, so the difference can be detected as shown here. And um, this is quite important because if this happens, the brain will correct it automatically and this create background tasks, tasks that can create headaches. And finally, we see um, the behavior of the image from different positions within the eye box, and um, especially for the distortion, that, that, that is very interesting. Um, it's presented here with different driver sizes, for example, but you could imagine comparing different hot products, uh, different proposals from the suppliers, so you could switch very quickly between two different HUD systems, which is a very uh, efficient tool to for decision making. Um, especially because it gives you, if you don't have optical expertise, it allows you to make a decision based on what you see. Um, so now I'll, I'll get more into details um, about the, the solution that we have in CATIA. So HOS stands for um, HUD Optical Analysis. And basically, it lets you quantify the quality of the virtual image of a head-up display. So use parameters from the digital markup to provide metrics to analyze like optical aberrations. Um, so it's good to compare performances of different technical proposals, validate conformity with specifications, and, and evaluate the impact of design changes on the quality um, of the image. For example, if you decide to change the angle um, or if you have other constraints for the packaging and you have to move the mirrors, how is that going to affect the whole system? So um, this is an example, a very uh, simple um, system. So what we have is that the, the light is first emitted by the PGU and reflected onto the mirrors. It's then reflected by the windshield or the combiner. It goes towards the driver's eye, which we define here in several positions, and that's what we we'll call the eye box. And then the image, of course, will appear as though it were located a few meters ahead, and that's what we call the target image. And we'll take all these parameters into account as inputs for our simulation. Um, for those of you who are already familiar with POS, you'll know that every POS tool is um, fully integrated with CATIA. Uh, so you recognize here the, the ambient source, which is used to recreate an environment, the display source, which can be used to generate your PGU if you want to get an actual image. And below that, you have the radiance sensor, which is the sensor used when you want to simulate the human eye. And then the HOA tool is just an, adi an additional simulation tool. Um, and everything in this, this tool, so I'll describe it later. When you, when you open it, it looks like this and you basically just have to fill it uh, with your different parameters and objects. Um, so it let you select, uh, lets you select, for example, um, the axis, so uh, vehicle direction, top direction, so that you know how to orientate the, the whole system. Um, everything will be computed automatically, and so you'll find here all the parts previously mentioned in, in the previous slides. So mirrors in PGU, windshield combiner, eye box, and target image. 
Um, for the target image, you have the typical parameters that you would expect for HUD, such as look over angle, look down angle, virtual image distance, and you can very easily switch those to, to see the influence uh, of, of changing those parameters. This is the, the eye box definition. Basically, you just select the, the driver's eye points, and then you can select the size of your eye box. Um, and you know, we also have a multi-configuration tool, which allows you to set different driver sizes. So for example, here, we've got the central eye box, and we've got then a, a second configuration, which is 40 mils higher, and lower um, eye box, which is 40 mil lower. Um, this is a very imp um, important point as well, uh, which is the, the warping. Um, basically, you, we have a tool to, to build the warping <coughs> sorry, and export it um, as a text file. And so this will let you know the um, what uh, processing needs to be applied, what image processing needs to be applied to the PGU in order to compensate for the um, distortion after going through the system. Um, here you can choose the size and sampling of your PGU based on your specifications. We also have predefined values that we got from typical PGUs used in the industry um, that you can see here. So overall, again, with the predefined parameters, lets you quickly test a simulation, uh, but you can, you can really um, customize it depending on, on your own system. Um, this is a very quick video, which doesn't start, so I'll just, sorry, I'll just skip this. I don't know why it's not starting. Um, from the design, um, and still within the within Katia, we can perform the analysis with the tool that I showed you earlier. So we can uh, generate the different uh, virtual images corresponding to the different configurations that I showed you, so the three um, different, height, uh, different heights that I showed you. Um, we can generate the optical volume, which um, is a very useful one because it lets you see anywhere where the light will propagate, and this is important, for example, for um, when you're trying to design the, the IP top roll uh, so that it will fit with the with the HUD system, and also to make sure that no car component gets in the way uh, of the lights. Otherwise, you will be otherwise you will see on, on your HUD, and it's very important. For example, it could be uh, any 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 you know the wheel. Sometimes you you're not expecting it, but actually you find that your your HUD image uh, happens to be behind the wheel, and that's problematic, um, and, and so on. Um, the ghost's image is another very important point. So here you can see the uh, the main image and then the ghost image, and we um, can measure the difference between the two. Then we have the image sharpness. Um, so here you can see the, the spot size, so that lets you see how blurry your image will be. Um, and then we have the image astigmatism which, again, is uh, very uh, it is good to visualize because you can see that the two focus points, um, you can see how, the, how blurry the image will be depending on where you're focusing. And finally, um, dynamic distortion. So this is how the image will be distorted when you move your head around in the eye box. And um, this is also very interesting because, as you can see here, these dotted lines, they show where the image will be cropped. So at this point, you know that you have so much distortion that the image is actually being distorting past the optical volume, so it gets cropped. Uh, so you lose, you lose some data. And then for each of those, we can, get, we can generate reports. Um, so that gives you numerical values to assess your system to objectively qualify the quality of the image through a report. Um, and to give you an idea, this sort of simulation takes roughly 15 minutes, and it goes through thousands of different configurations, uh, which is a number we can 
reach quite easily if you, if you multiply the number of driver sizes, eyebox positions, points in the target image, and so on. So uh, it's um, you need to have an automated system to analyze it. You can't just go through each point one by one and decide whether it's acceptable or not. You need, you need an overall view, which the reports allow you to, to have. Um, this is an example. Uh, these are some charts that were made to compare two hard designs. And um, as I mentioned before, not only do we have an optical analysis tool, we also have a design tool that lets you design your own mirrors. So uh, basically, it's it works pretty much in the same way at HOA, but um, like you select the different components, windshield, etc. You set your targets, and it will try to optimize mirrors to match certain metrics, optical metrics. And so these two, um, one of them was from an existing model, uh, which was um, in an in a existing vehicle. And the other one was made using uh, Spio's design tools for, for HUD. And so we have, um, we have a radio chart showing several curves. And each curve corresponds to an eye box, so a driver size. Um, once again, the, the radial um, axis reflects the, the virtual image defects, such as distortion, astigmatisms, and so on. And the max, maximum accepted values for each optical metric are depicted by the red curve. So this is something that you would define. Um, it's specific to each OEM or supplier. Everyone defines their own uh, standards. And it can then quickly, um, quickly compare. Um, so this is good for design comparisons, so different models from an OEM, uh, different supplier proposals at an RFQ phase, um, different design options during the engineering phase. There's so many moments when you would like to be able to compare different, different systems. Um, so in order to have um, each of these metrics, we can develop plugins um, that can be done either by HOA users themselves or by Optis under a specification. So um, different companies have different metrics, so if you tell us we'd like to be able to see this and have these criteria, we can help you build that plugin. And the plugin mechanism enables to protect the intellectual properties of the owner, um, so it's, the distribution remains under under control. Um, as a conclusion, I'd like to to summarise the uh, the benefits of using um, SPIOs for. Um, HUD analysis. Um, as an OEM, it, it helps you define your specifications. It allows you simulating what certain HUD's parameter, parameters will look like in the car before sending these specifications to your supplier. Um, it lets you see how the HUD system provided by the supplier or the design um, or, or that is designed in-house integrates with the whole vehicle. And as a supplier, it helps you test and validate your system, create reports, um, and also, one important point that I'd like to come back to is the we have a, a feature called Spears Components, which is um, allows you to basically export some data, some CAD data and some Spears data, all bundled, bundled together in a black box that you can send to your um, OEM for, to an OEM, for example, and that lets you preserve IP. Now, we said earlier that the HUD system can't really be studied on its own. Um, because it ties in with other areas in the car. This means that no matter the amount of optimization that's done on one part, such as, such as the projection system for the supplier or the packaging for the OEM, OEM for example, there will need to be many iterations between the three um, main actors. And it's really our goal with this tool to make this connection more seamless and easy for everyone and identify issues as early as possible so they can be fixed at a um, lesser cost. Um, so as conclusion, we, we address the needs uh, in terms of uh, design analysis and experience all along the design process uh, that I showed you uh, in intro. First, we have um, driving simulator to specify parameters, investigate how the driver will react in different scenarios. Then we can actually design the optical system. Then we can virtually uh, we can analyze the system with the optical analysis. We can simulate your driver perception to see what you would actually see in the real car. And then we can analyze uh, variation analysis. So 
I don't have time today to get into all of these, so that's why I focused on the optical analysis. But um, if you have questions about any of these, um, you can, of course, refer to, um, to my colleagues. Um, so that's, um, that's it for me. Um, thank you for listening. And um, once again, if you have any questions, you can, um, you can ask you can email or you can you can ask in the um, in the webinar and um, I'll try and answer within the time that we have or um, email us and we'll answer them later. Um, thank you for listening. Thanks, Claire. So as Claire mentioned, um, if there's any questions from anyone here or anyone listening on the webinar, um, we have some time to take. Uh, some questions, if there's any topics that you're interested by and um, want any more information on anything. I'll leave um, this open for some time for any questions to come through the chat. I think here there's no questions from those who are attending here, but um, if, if you still have any questions and you're connected to the webinar, uh, you can ask them through the chat. Um, is there plans to go so the question was, um, currently what Clara was showing was for SPIOS for CATIA, so if there was an implementation plan for SPIOS for NX. Um, I'm not sure about the, um, what the plan is. Um, I'm sure there will be, um, depending on the uh, on different needs that we have, I, I don't know where we are on the roadmap. I don't know if you have more information, Kishore. I think it's um, supposed to be coming at the end of this year, or that's what okay. um, I think that's what the status is. I don't see any questions coming in through the chat, sir, but um, I'm going to leave this open for the next 15, 20 minutes in case um, anybody thinks of a question that they want to ask. Um, I'll, I'll let you know if anything uh, comes up in the chat. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on it as well. Just feel free to, to ask anything if you want. So there's a question from uh, David about whether um, these presentations would be available. Um, so I will, or we will be sending out um, copies of both my presentation from earlier as well as Claire's presentation uh, to all those who registered for the webinar. Um, so that should happen sometime later today or uh, latest on Monday.
Uh, there's another question here about whether it's possible to have customized reports in HOA. Um, yeah. Um, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the plugins let you customize um, the, the metrics you're, you're going to um, analyze and also the reports that you'll generate. And these are, um, this is done by using DLLs. So if a customer has a specific um, report that they would like to see, it's possible for us to include it? We can int integrate it, yes. So as I said, we'll use either your own um, or we'll create one with you if you don't have any.
just a comment for anyone who's still on the call. Um, I wanted to mention this earlier, but uh, we'll be doing a lot more of these webinars um, in the coming months, probably about one every two or three months or so. So for anyone who's local, we definitely invite you to come out here uh, to watch in person. We provide lunch, and you know it's a good chance to you know talk with us or ask us any questions. But as well for for dialing in, um, I think it's a great way to convey some information about many technical topics. So we definitely invite you to um, attend the future webinars as well. Okay, so I don't see any other questions, so I think we will uh, stop the presentation. Uh, thanks again, Claire, for um, sharing your knowledge on the head-up display topic. If there's any questions um, after this finishes, um, we're always available to contact. Um, you can contact our, our technical support line if you have specific technical questions or your account manager for any uh, sales-related questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.